get started. Thank you, Lord, for being in this place this morning. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just envelop this room, Lord. Every single chair, every heart and soul in this place would just be touched by your presence. We love you and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
the close of the service again because of the theme of the message today. We're going to talk about the Passover meal. So when you come and bring God's tithe and offerings, and as you go about and shake hands with one another or hug and neck, why don't you also grab the communion emblems so that you can enjoy that with us at the close of the service. Come on, let's move about and say hello one to another.
So welcome back. This first Sunday after Easter, I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, Father Jim. He's a Catholic priest here in town, and uh, he told me, hey, <laughs> sometimes it's the, the lowest attendance, too, because people come out on Easter, and then, okay, I did my thing for the year, and I'm going to stay home next Sunday. But we're glad you're here today, worshiping the Lord. I'm glad you make it a steady habit to come to the house of the Lord. The Bible says, as the end times uh, draw near, or we're in them, that we should come together more often rather than less often. And today's society has not found church attendance as valuable as it used to, unfortunately. But I do. I like seeing you. I like coming together. And I'm glad that you're here today. I, I mentioned that we're going to enjoy uh, the Lord's Supper, which is uh, symbolic of a meal. And so we're going to talk about meals today. How many remember what you had for lunch on Tuesday? <laughs> Why well, eat the same thing every day? <laughs> uh, lunch, it's not very many people can remember what you had for lunch on Sunday. How many remember what you had for dinner five weeks ago? What day? You know, you know, I'll be looking at my journal. <laughs> can find it. We had this lady, by the way, one of the churches where we pastor, and she logged everything. She could tell you what the weather was like 30 years ago on that specific day. Some people really meticulous up like that. So we probably can't remember, but, but here's another question about our meals. Last question. What has been your most memorable meal over the last year? That might be a little bit easier because it was a high point or it was memorable for a specific reason. Maybe it was Thanksgiving. Maybe it was a, a birthday barbecue that you had or something that you took to the park and made it especially memorable. What, what makes that meal memorable? Maybe it was the food you ate. My wife's a tremendous cook, as you can tell. And it's, it's hard to pinpoint one specific meal because... All of our meals are really good. Maybe it was the food. Maybe it was the occasion. It was a special day and celebration of something. Maybe it was because of the people that you ate the meal with. Uh, meals are an important part of our lives. And down through the ages in different cultures, as they celebrate certain meals, they remember values that are important to that particular culture. And that's what the Passover is all about that we're going to be looking at today from our text. Meals shape who we are. They kind of form the rhythm of our lives. And so this morning we're going to look in particular at a meal that has shaped the lives of a group of people for over 3,500 years. An important meal, the most central meal in all of the Jewish culture. How many of you have ever participated in a Seder? Yeah, they're really interesting to reflect back on uh, the Passover and all that deep meaning behind it. So we're in the middle of this preaching series from the book of Exodus, our journey to freedom, and finally we get to one of the, the main sections of the entire event, what, what the book is named after, the Exodus. They're actually leaving, exiting uh, Egypt and starting their journey into their life of freedom into the promised land. And we, we hear about uh, this group of several million Jewish people, several million Hebrews, leaving their bondage in Egypt to a life of freedom. That's the Exodus. And it happens, interestingly enough, in the middle of the night. And that night forms the basis for what will become the defining ritual for Jewish self-identity. On that particular night, God kept watch over Israel. And because of that, Israel would keep watch of that one specific night every year. They have for it for centuries and centuries. A night that they would remember that fateful night when they were uh, allowed to go free from their captivity. So tonight, today's message tonight, a night of watching, a night of watching. Let's look at the story. Let's start with Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 42. It was a night of watching. That's where we have the title for today's message. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching, kept by the Lord, by all the people of Israel throughout the generations. So note, there's two nights. It was this specific night that they were delivered, but it's another night where they continue to celebrate it 
year after year after year. It's the Passover. Two different nights of, of watching. The original night of watching and then the night of watching on a continuous basis. And that line is kind of used interchangeably. You don't know which sometimes unless you look at it carefully, which night it's referring to. And as we read through this, this account, we'll, we'll gather a little bit of historical awareness of the importance of that night. But I'd also like for us today to think about a third night. There was a third night when there were these 12 men gathered together with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're referred to as disciples, the closest followers of Jesus. And they were gathered together in this upper room. They had just seen this man, Jesus, who they had followed for three years or so, be humiliated and brutally murdered on a cross. It's called the crucifixion, right? Where Jesus paid the penalty for the sins of all mankind. Anybody grateful for that today? Amen. And uh, right before that event, however, before the crucifixion, Jesus gathered disciples together and they celebrated this Passover as they had every year since way back in the Old Testament to remember their exodus from Egypt. So three different nights really I'd like to look at. Not only the original Passover, but then uh, this Passover that they celebrate every year. And then I want us to focus on Jesus and this last supper that he shared with his disciples. And we'll use the people who celebrated those meals as guides for our study today. Our first guide, is going to be Joshua. I'm not sure if that's a, a, a line, line in your handout you need to fill in. Our first guy will be Joshua. He is the man who would become Moses' assistant. And after Moses passed from the scene, then Joshua became the leader of the Israelites. But in this particular story, the original Passover, and where did Passover come from? We'll get to that in a moment. The original Passover, Joshua's just a little guy. He's probably not even in double digits, 10. He's probably 7, 8 of the first original Passover. So he's just a little kid when they are released from their slavery, their captivity. So we're going to look at the Passover through the eyes of this little guy. The second guy will be King Josiah. He was one of the last Jewish kings before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And after years without a Passover, there was a time when they didn't celebrate it because they were far from God and didn't have an acknowledgement of his presence in their life. But Josiah became the king and he reinstituted again the book of the law, which is the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and sometimes referred to as the Pentateuch. Why? Because there's five books. A pentagram is a five-sided so Pentateuch is the first five books, the book of the law. That's the only Bible they had back in those days. The New Testament had not been written yet, or all the prophecies in the Old Testament. And King Josiah reinstituted these five books as important for the people of God and started up the sacrificial system again. And we'll look at the ritual through his eyes as the king of Israel as he celebrated this particular Passover 800 years after the original release from Egypt. And then our final guy would be Jesus when he shared this meal with his disciples that we will be reflecting on as we share communion at the close of our service today. So we're going to look at the transformation of the Passover from the eyes of Jesus. And again, this is 600 years after Josiah the king. So these are separated by some significant Time frames, aren't they? So we find Joshua's experience, the first Passover, when the angel passed over Egypt. And then we see Josiah's experience, where he's following the instructions given to them in Exodus. And then we'll see Jesus' observance that last night of his life before he's crucified. So here's the clear message. You can write this down. That God delivers his people. He did it in the past. He's doing it in the present time, and he'll also do it in the future. He is our deliverer, and he wants to deliver you from your challenges, your sin primarily, but other things in your life. How many have found the Lord to be a deliverer of some of your heartaches, some of your pains, some of your challenges? He is the deliverer. So let's look at these three quickly in the time that we have together. A lot of information to run through, so I might go a little bit fast. Number one, 
Joshua's Passover, it was in a hurry. We saw that uh, the plagues were designed, there's 10 plagues, right? They were designed to get the attention of the Egyptians as well as the Israelites, but particularly the Egyptians to show that the Egyptian gods were powerless, but God, our God was the all powerful one. How many know that to be true? And, and the 10th and final plague was to be aimed at Pharaoh, the king himself. So the firstborn sons in Pharaoh's line were wiped out as all the firstborn sons in the entirety of Egypt, the, the, the heathen nation of Egypt, not the Israelites, because the Israelites were given a warning and that if you do this, then when the angel, the death angel passes over it, your firstborn will be spared, but the Egyptian firstborn will die. Let's look at that instruction found in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So can you imagine being there and, and hearing the wails of the mothers and fathers and family members as that angel passed over? Imagine if you have children, the firstborn son in your family would be totally wiped out, and all the animals. Let's say you had 50 goats, and they all had baby goaties. And those goatees would, <laughs> would be wiped out on that night. It's probably the worst possible day that you can imagine. You, you hear the screams and the wails of everybody there in the ancient Near East. Everyone would be affected, both man and beast, it says. But God had this special way that he was going to protect his people and here are the instructions. Look at verse 22. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that you have in that basin. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to enter into your houses to strike you. So again, let's turn our attention to young Joshua. He was the firstborn in his family too. Glad that his parents gained blood over the doorposts. Yeah. He was spared because his parents would have been wailing and gnashing as well. But they followed the instructions. I'm not sure that there were some questions that they had about to what God told them to do. To protect themselves. I'm sure that you would have asked some questions too. And you might even ask this question. Why would God require us to do anything? Well, in the same way today, God could save anybody that he wanted to, right? He has all power. He has the ability to forgive anyone of their sins. But we have to take an action. Right. We have to take a step. We have to put our faith in God, yeah. right? Yeah. And then that faith in God is followed by works because faith without works is dead. So we do things to continue to earn God's favor and His love. But the way we get to heaven is by putting our faith in Him. We have to do something. Yes. So He required them to do something too. I mean, He, he could have told the destroyer to pass over that area and, and to save all the Israelites. But He wanted them to take some kind of action step to ensure that they were spared. So if you were Joshua, maybe you would be a little bit nervous. You've heard about this thing that's going to happen. You're just a little kid, and mom and dad are killing this animal to get the blood in the basin. And they went out and they cut a hyssop bush so that they would have kind of a paintbrush to paint. Are, are we using enough blood? Is our paintbrush big enough? I mean, you have all these kinds of questions. And make sure that they got the instructions right. And yet, that's the way that God seems to work throughout the Bible. There's always something that we must do in order to be counted among God's people. He could save everyone, but He wants us to put our faith in Him. And then to act on that faith by living out our Christian walk and be a follower of Jesus. Write this down. We have a role to accept in the invitation for God's protection. God wants to protect you. Can someone say praise the Lord for that? We have a lot of stuff going on. And there's a covering, an umbrella that he places over the life of a Christian. God wants to protect, but we have to accept that invitation. So Joshua's family, they put blood on the doorposts as a way of expressing their faith 
in God who would protect them from death and they followed the instructions given to them. So this destroyer made his way through the homes there in Egypt and every firstborn sons died. And we read that there was a great cry throughout all of Egypt because there was not a house where there was not someone who was dead. Imagine that in Las Vegas today. All the houses there are here. There are about two million people here in the Las Vegas Valley. There's not a house that was not touched by this death angel. Can you imagine the despair and the funeral homes and uh, everything that they would have to go through? The chaos, the confusion, the, the grief. The, the people of Israel, however, were delivered. They, they couldn't believe it. All of the Egyptians experienced such horrible action, but not them. So listen to the account of their departure, because in the midst of this chaos, God's using the confusion to release the Israelites into their journey to freedom. Let's read it from verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste or in a hurry. But they said, we shall be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt, they had been captive slaves for 430 years. And at the end of those 430 years, this very day, this very night, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So they left in a hurry because the Egyptians finally, even if Pharaoh resisted, even if Pharaoh was stubborn, he says, forget it, I'm not letting them go no matter what. I'm God, not that God. I'm the God. You've got to stay here. But the Egyptians threw such a pitch, such a fit, that they said, get out of here because you killed our firstborns. Are we next? Are you going to kill all of us off? Yes, yes. So they let the Israelites go free, and God had instructed them to ask the Egyptians to give them what they wanted to go on their trip. And they literally gave them gold, silver, clothing, all kinds of stuff just to get out of the way. And we're going to touch on this this kneading or this unleavened bread to you hold in your hands or have near you somewhere, that little wafer that's made out of unleavened dough. That's why it's so tasteless. And it hasn't risen into this big fat loaf of bread because there's no leaven in it. We'll get to that in just a moment. So everything is rushed. The Egyptians were in a panic. Their dead sons were in the house turning gray. They don't know what's Rick and Mortis was sitting in, what do we do? We're afraid, and the, and the Israelites went in and said, give me your gold. Okay, take it, just get out of here. Just take it. The Israelites, they didn't even have time, the text says, my nose itches, they didn't even have time to let their bread rise. <coughs> How many have ever been sour with bread before? It's a little bit of an interesting science. You have to put the starter together in this jar and it looks gross and eventually it gets to the point where you can knead it and make it into bread but it's got to rise and there's fermentation that goes on and all that. That's what they were doing with their bread with the leaven that they put in it. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But here are the Egyptians, they gave away their jewelry, they gave away their clothing, probably hoping to appease whoever was causing this devastation. And the Israelites stumbled out of their house into their freedom. They had been in Egypt, it says, for 430 years. That's generation after generation has passed away, right? Great, great, great grandma passed away. They're still here. Little Joshua's eight or ten years old, maybe. They didn't have time to carefully plan their exit, or did they? 430 years. Weren't they expecting to be released? Yeah. Evidently, they didn't have that amount of faith, but that's how God works sometimes. Yeah. They leave all of a sudden without any advanced warning. If you want to do an interesting study in the Bible sometime, look up that phrase in the concordance, all of a sudden or suddenly. So they were up in the upper room and it says that suddenly the Holy Ghost came upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. 
So Mary was just living her little teenage life and suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon her and she became pregnant. Look at the suddenly is in scripture. That's what's happening here. All of a sudden, their neighbor's children are dying. Their flocks are dying. And they bring their flocks and their elderly parents, they try to pack enough food. They don't know where they're going and they don't know how long it's going to take them to get there. That's what freedom feels like sometimes. In fact, 150 years ago here in our great country, a group of slaves in the United States were declared to be free. One woman named Laura Smalley wrote this about their experience, those who were born into slavery in Texas. Here's what she wrote. It's, she's reflecting back on that day when slavery was announced over and they could be free. Here's what she wrote. We didn't know where to go. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, they startled us. Like, to turn some of them out, you know, we, we, we didn't know where to go. They turned us out just like, you know, they turn out cattle. And she laughs and says over and over again, we didn't know where to go. They had been used to that land. It was of captivity of slavery. It was horrible, the oppression that was placed on the slaves of our country. And suddenly, suddenly they were released because of a proclamation that was made and they didn't know where to go because all they'd known is slavery. Think about Joshua back in those days in Egypt as his parents gathered all the possessions that they could. They gathered the family and the elderly around them and their infants to leave Egypt and literally go to God knows where. They had no idea. The truth is, freedom can be disorienting. You can write that down. I think it's on your handout. Here's what we need to know. The circumstances of the Israelites gaining their freedom was full of chaos and, and anxiety. They would probably remember that night as one of the most stressful nights of their entire life. Can you imagine? Everybody's crying and wailing in the streets and the sirens are going to sirens. Okay, there was a lot of chaos going on, right? Frenzy, hurry. Probably remember that night, full of anxiety, worry, stress, and confusion. There's not one person that it didn't impact. There was not one person that it didn't affect. But as of that night, they were free. Amen. They were free. Amen. What they had dreamed about for years. The Israelites were free. Why? Because God delivered them. He stepped into history and he did something concrete in their lives to change their circumstances. Can I suggest to you today that God is still in the delivery business yes. and he can step into your life and make a concrete difference too. In the midst of some of your chaotic, anxious, stressful moments, he wants to step into your life as a deliverer too. How in the world am I going to get out of this financial situation that I'm in? God wants to step into your situation in the midst of your chaos and bring order. Oh, I don't know if my marriage will ever survive this. God can step into your situation and he is the great deliverer. Someone give him praise for that today because it's true. He delivers his people. He did it in the past. He's doing it now and he will continue to do it in the future. That's the original Passover. Second, Josiah through this huge Passover feast, the king. Mixed throughout the descriptions of that original night of so much chaos in Egypt, there are instructions for God's people to commemorate that night every year on a specific date. They were given a ritual in order to remember that night. Roughly 800 years after the events that we just described a minute ago, the original Exodus, Josiah is the ruler over the southern kingdom when his scribes discovered the forgotten book of the law. We haven't been observing the Torah. We haven't been observing the Pentateuch. We haven't been observing the book of the law. We need to reinstitute it and celebrate the Passover once again. And he was horrified that they hadn't been doing it for all of these centuries. So here's what he did. It's described for us in 2 Chronicles. Josiah kept the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. And they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month. We're the 16th right now. Then Josiah contributed to the lay people as Passover offerings for all who were present, lambs and young goats, listen to this, from the flock to a number of 30,000 goats. 
Can you imagine the butchering that went on that day? I was watching that Facebook post by Martha, who was not here because of her ankle injury, but her and her sister and mom and brothers and other family members had a gathering this last week. It was a special meal that they will remember. I was going to ask Aiden and Evan to come up and describe it for me because they slaughtered a real pig in their backyard. And they hung the head up on this tree and they're shaving their hair off of it. I guarantee those two little boys will never forget that day. Can you imagine 30,000 goats? 30,000, 3,000 bulls. That's a lot of beef. And these were part of the king's possession. Talk about a huge party. What a barbecue that was. And Josiah provided food for well over a million people. Can you imagine throwing a barbecue for all of Las Vegas? Huge celebration. And they say that Passover was supposed to mark the beginning of the year. They, they worked their calendar around the Passover. The Passover was the beginning of their calendar year. And they built everything else around that event. The day of Passover was to kick off a week-long celebration of parts. I like leftovers. Anybody like leftovers? Everyone was to be included. The slave to the wealthy home uh, landowner. Passover was supposed to be the biggest party of the year for the Jewish people. And this would be the defining ritual of self-identity for the Jewish people. But this wasn't just a party. It was a party with purpose. The instructions for the Passover were meant to recreate some of the chaos and the confusion that they experienced 800 years earlier at the original Passover. Remembering the hurry and the frenzy that made it so much more powerful as God acted to save them right in the middle of all of these Egyptian baby boys dying in their parents' home. They were meant to remember that day. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering what he had done in the past reassures them that he'll continue to do that today. And he'll continue to do it again until he comes once again and we eat the marriage supper of the Lamb in glory. Three times during the Passover instructions, the Israelites were given a peculiar action to do. You can write them down. They would put the Lamb's blood on their doorposts. They would eat unleavened bread. And they would consecrate their firstborn. And each action took them back to that first Passover some 800 years before that. Each action would help them to understand what they were celebrating through the Passover. For the sake of time, I'm not going to look at all three of them. Uh, I've got too many other things that I want to share with you today. But we will zoom in on maybe the most famous one, eating unleavened bread, because we're going to do that at the close of our service. Listen to how it's described in chapter 13. <coughs> Seven days we shall eat unleavened bread. Remember, they didn't even have time to let their bread rise in the original Passover. They just took it with them. The starter did. They yeast with them because they didn't have time to bake the bread and let it rise and prepare to be uh, made into the bread loaves that they enjoyed. On the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all of your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did when I came out of Egypt. Now let's think about the layers that's going on here. First, they would eat unleavened bread during Passover as a way of remembering that they had to leave Egypt in such a hurry. We didn't even have time for the leaven to take effect and for the bread to rise. We had to get out of there. We had to leave in a hurry. And then secondly, the original a practice gets expanded on for this ritual. And they don't just eat unbreaded, unleavened bread. They were to remove leaven from the entire territory. It's like we have sin, leaven in our life that ferments and gets gross. Yeah. I mean, all the effects of sin in your life that has made some rotten attitudes and actions out of you. We need to get rid of all that leaven. And to get rid of all those things that cause sin to rise in our life, if you will. They were to get rid of all the leaven. In other words, if you had a starter jar of sourdough bread, get rid of it. You've got to start brand new. Get a new jar. We're starting from scratch all over again. 
brand new beginning for the people of God. The Jews in ancient Near East, they weren't, they weren't buying yeast at the grocery store. The leaven that's referred to here was what we would call with sourdough bread a starter. And if you've made sourdough bread and tried to make a starter, you know that you're always worried that you know you didn't do something quite right and that, that starter was going to somehow die. If you've never tried it before, I encourage you to try it sometime. It's kind of an interesting process. And on this day, Israel was to destroy all their leaven. They would kill all their starters. They would dump them out. They would clean all the residue out from their homes. They wanted a fresh, clean start. How am I glad when Jesus comes in your life, he cleans you out completely. He gives you a brand new start. The Bible says, as if you've never sinned, Amen. clean before the Lord I stand. And to me, not one blemish does he see, one old song says. Clean. Then for a week, uh, they would eat crackers instead of bread. And at the end of the week, they had no leaven to make normal bread with. So they created a starter from scratch. They mixed flour and water every day, and they watched it as yeast began to grow. And finally, as if by the hand of God, they had leaven once again. It's a miracle when you see that in your jar. It's crazy. Their daily bread returned. So how have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer before? Give us this day our daily bread. You wonder where he got that from. When the sons asked why they got rid of all the leaven in the first place, they would say, it's because of what the Lord did for us when we came out of Egypt. We get a fresh, brand new start. Give us what we need for today, oh God. Yes. Imagine the effect that this Passover had on the people of Israel. They follow this pattern to remember how God had delivered them 800 years before. In the middle of their chaos in Egypt, as they watched the leaven return, they realized that God is still at work. Even though that was 800 years ago, He's still working in my life, that He's still working among God's people. Each time the Passover was celebrated, God's people were reminded of who God is and how He acts in the world. That's why Passover is so important even to this day for Jews who celebrate the Savior. I think we should pick up some of those practices ourselves, maybe. The celebration was meant to remind God's people, you can write it down, of how He acts in the midst of chaos. How many have had a little bit of chaos during the pandemic, through your job, through your health? There's things happening all the time politically in our world today. I mean, we're all on pins and needles wondering what in the world our president's going to say or do next and what that political party is going to do and who's going to lead this party to go. I mean, there's things happening in the East. There's things happening in the Middle East. There's things happening in our own country on our borders. It's chaotic time for us, is it not? Yes. That Satan God who worked in the past, however, it can deliver us today. He is the deliverer. What he did in the past, he's doing now, and he will in the future. Let's look at number three. Jesus' final nights. We started in the 15th century B.C. Then we jumped forward to the 7th century with King Josiah. And now we're going to move forward another 600 years to the 1st century A.D. And look at the life of Jesus, who there lived in Nazareth. And he had been speaking about the coming kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming. And told all these parables. The kingdom of God is like these people who go out. The kingdom of God is like the seed being planted. He tells story after story. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And he kept saying that the deliverance of God is coming soon. And this is what happened. Read it in Luke 22 with me. Ladies, you're going to be studying Luke. Then came the day of unleavened bread. They celebrated that day every year on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. This is centuries later, 600 years after Josiah. So Jesus sent Peter and John, the two that we looked at Easter Sunday that ran to the tomb, remember? Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. Go ahead and get the meal ready so that we gather together and be ready for us to just sit down and enjoy it. Most of you know about the scene. It's the last night of Jesus' life before he's arrested, hauled away, there was a, a false trial. He never had done anything wrong. He was accused of things he had never said or done. He was eventually burnt, murdered, crucified on the cross. Think about how all of history has been moving toward this particular night. 1,500 years earlier, God saved his people from slavery as they moved out of Egypt into their land of freedom, their land of promise. 
And every year since then, God's people were supposed to honor that night to sacrifice the lamb, to gather with a sense of urgency, with a sense of expectation, to speak of the saving activity of God, what he did before he will continue to do for us today. Amen. And year after year, these lessons in Exodus were repeated. All of history prepared the world for this night when Jesus would eat Passover with his disciples. Maybe that's why Jesus said this. Look at verse 15. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Amen. How many believe that Jesus came once as a baby, grew to adulthood, and died for your sins? Amen. Rose again from the dead. He's right now in heaven making a place ready for you, Christian. Amen. But he's coming again to restore his kingdom. Jesus was there at creation. He has always been part of the triune Godhead. He was there when the destroyer moved throughout Egypt and all those firstborn babies were killed. He was there when God's people fled out of their captivity from Egypt. He was there at every Passover that were celebrated throughout all the centuries, the history of the Israelites. And now he gets to celebrate the culmination of that ritual as he gathers with his disciples right before he dies on the cross. The Passover was all about remembering the past. That's why we say, do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father. Listen to what he says in Luke 22, because he's creating something new here. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this. In remembrance of me. Suddenly the present, which had been pulled from the history of the past, created something new for the future. This meal that had been celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years has reshaped and cast, recast as a new reminder of the new deliverance that's available to the church today. Something new has been born and Jesus is right at the center of it. Instead of a sacrificial lamb that is slaughtered and its blood let out to paint the doorposts, once and for all, Jesus died on the cross. His blood was shed there for you so that his blood could be applied to the doorposts of our hearts. Yes. So we would never have to experience death, but we could live forever and ever and ever. Glory. So give the Lord praise for that. Yes. Instead of a sacrificed lamb, the firstborn, his only begotten son was sacrificed as a lamb to deliver everyone else. And instead of deliverance from a power-hungry king, there's a new deliverance from slavery, from sin, to where he can be ushered into the kingdom of God. Instead of a meal that looks back, this meal would also look forward to the day when all things would be made new. This blood is the new blood is the new symbol is the new covenant of my blood. Do this until I come again. It has a future to it as well. When Jesus ate the Passover that fateful night, he pulled in the past, he acted in the present, and he casted a vision, cast a vision for the future. Are you looking forward to Jesus coming again or when you die? That immediately you don't even experience death per se, your body will quit functioning, but you will live on. Your spirit will never die. So there's a past, a present, and a future. What he did in the past, he's doing now, and he will continue to do throughout all eternity. We will live and rule and reign with him throughout all eternity. I give him praise for that. Amen. So we started this morning talking about a memorable meal. A meal that you might remember. We have stories to tell about them. We reminisce about them. Aiden and Evan will talk about that butchered pig in their backyard for a long time, I'm sure. And they have a way of even shaping who we are. We've opened the window on three different time periods. The night that Jesus, or excuse me, God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. That Passover celebration that Josiah instituted with 30,000 goats and 3,000 bulls being slaughtered as a sacrifice. And then that last night of Jesus' life where he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. But of course there's a fourth time period. And we get to share in that today. You hold in your hands these communion emblems. 
of a piece of unleavened bread. More like a cracker, isn't it? Because the yeast did not rise. There was no yeast in it. It symbolizes because of Jesus, he's taken our sin away. Someone say, praise the Lord for that. Tom's here to serve anyone who has not yet received a symbol. Having read that original Passover celebration and the instructions, we're going to celebrate what Jesus gave to us. A new Passover. This tiny little meal that connects our present with the past, but also it connects us to the future. As we celebrate this meal, I invite you to consider maybe some of the aspects of chaos that you have in your life right now. Are you going through a particularly difficult and challenging time? Are you going through a time of challenge, heartache, pain? Could be in any area of your life. Jesus wants to step into the middle of your chaos and instantly, in a moment, bring deliverance for you too. That's what this symbolizes for us today. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? So grateful for your sacrifice on the cross. After supper, as you gathered there with disciples, you said, this bread is a symbol of my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat all of it. We do that now with thanksgiving and appreciation in our heart, remembering that you have afforded to us wholeness, completeness, deliverance, help in our time of chaos. And by faith, we put our confidence in you to bring about deliverance in our chaotic situations too. You can make order where there is no order. I pray that you do that for family, for individual, for every person here today. You stepped into history to make it possible for us to experience your deliverance, your help right now. And we receive it by faith as we share together in communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the bread. God stepped into history and he did something concrete in their lives to change their circumstances. And he will do the same for you. Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to pay in full the penalty of your sin. We remember that through this Passover celebration today. By your blood, we have been made free. We receive the forgiveness once again today as we share in this token, the symbol of your shed blood that was given for us upon the cross. Whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we close our time together, let's stand and just give him praise one last time. You might want to lift your voice, lift your hands. We're going to clap with praise and appreciation. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have afforded to us. So interesting for us to look at a passage in the book of Exodus written centuries, millenniums ago, and then how practical that brings us into the present, recognizing that you're delivering us today the same way you delivered the Israelites from slavery centuries ago. Give you praise and be honored. Help us to live in that freedom this week. Rejoicing in it and sharing it with others who need to hear about it as well. Bless your people as we go our way. Thank you for your presence as it goes with us wherever we go. We honor you, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go your way. We'll bring someone with you next week.